So we're heading north today to the Cleveland area to a site where the worst school fire disaster in American history occurred. 172 souls were lost on that day. We're going to tell you all about it here in a little bit. There's a memorial set up there. We've never been there before. And we're kind of interested to see what the memorial looks like and to tell you the story of what happened on that fateful day. Should be an interesting and powerful day emotionally. There are spirits of children who are said to haunt the location. So we'll take a look at that a little bit, see what we can come up with. We're planning on going to Lakeview Cemetery as well, where there is a memorial and where there are plenty of graves, including a lot of unidentified bodies who were recovered from the fire that are buried there in a mass grave. At 9 a.m. on March 4th, 1908, Nine-year-old Nils Thompson jumped out of a window at Lakeview Elementary to escape a fire that had started in the school's basement. Nearly 200 children who were lucky enough to escape watched as flames engulfed the school. Nils ran frantically among his schoolmates searching for his brother Thomas, but Thomas was nowhere to be found. Realizing his brother was still in the inferno, Nils ran back into the school Neither of the two Thompson boys would walk out of their school again. Nils and Thomas Thompson were among the 172 children and two teachers who were trapped inside the school and killed in the fire. Today we learn about the horrific Lakeview School fire in Collinwood, Ohio, a tragedy that has been called the worst school fire ever in America. So if you're curious, let's take a walk through history. So it was on this site right here in 1908 that the deadliest school fire in United States history happened. This was the former site of Lakeview Elementary School. It was a three-story building and fire broke out underneath the stairs near the boiler room. Since arriving from Switzerland and landing a job as a custodian for Lakeview School, Fritz Herter, a 46-year-old father of eight, followed the same daily routine. His first task of the day was to make sure the building was warm enough for the children. By 6.30 a.m., after adding some coal to the furnace, he was sweeping the halls and cleaning the classrooms. A little after eight, he would unlock the back doors and let the children playing in the schoolyard in, including four of his own, and they would flood into the school. It was Ash Wednesday. About an hour after school started, 13-year-old Emma Nybert was on her way to the basement washroom when she noticed something odd. The treads of the basement stairs were smoking. Emma could see Fritz. She shouted, the basement's on fire, while pointing to smoke rising from under the stairwell. What happened was when the fire broke out, um, the custodian ran upstairs from the basement to the first floor and rang the fire bell. Fritz rang the alarm, which was connected by a wire to a similar bell in the room on the second floor. So ringing one would ring both of them. There was no way to ring the fire bell in the basement, and there was no fire bell on the third floor. Fritz's five-year-old daughter, Ella, sat in the corner of Miss Irwin's room. He told her to hurry home, and he ran to both the front and rear entrance to ensure the doors were unlocked, tying open the inner doors to make exiting easier for the children. Air rushed through the doors into the school, feeding the basement fire, which would soon rage out of control. 
Now, the principal in the school was also a well, fourth grade teacher, and she knew that there was no fire drill for, uh, scheduled for that day, so she started sending her class down the stairs. There were essentially two exits, and unfortunately, there had been some construction that happened near the exits that narrowed the passageway exiting the building. There are harrowing tales of teachers who fought to save the lives of children as chaos swirled around them. Teachers dropping kids out of first floor windows to the grass below. Teachers who burned their own bodies as they blocked the fire so children wouldn't take a wrong turn and head into the flames. Teachers who saw the swell of bodies blocking the exits and diverted their classes to the fire escapes, even throwing chairs through the windows when they wouldn't open so the fire escapes could be accessed. First grade teacher Miss Lynn led her students to the back stairway. At the foot of the stairs, she noticed two things. First, that the right-hand exit doors were locked. Only the left-hand door was open. And second, some of the smaller children ahead of her had fallen. She stopped to give them a chance to stand up, but the children coming behind her knocked her down. Then more fell on top of her, and she went unconscious. Patrolman Wall, a local police officer, and Mr. Dorn, a member of the school board, arrived. Wall and Dorn spotted Miss Lynn lying on the floor inside. They managed to unlock the right-hand door, get inside the building, and pull her to safety. Wall, Dorn, and Fritz Herter began hauling out children, but the students were coming down the stairs faster than the three men could clear them away. Miss Fisk began grabbing children in her classroom, carrying them to the nearest window, dropping them out, then going back for more. She then entered the central area of the first floor and began grabbing more students and repeating the process. As a wall of flame entered her classroom, she jumped out herself with two children wrapped in her skirts. She was taken by ambulance to Glenville Hospital where she died around noon of burns and smoke inhalation. Miss Weiler marched her 39 students down the rear stairway, commanding calmness. But even this strict minister's daughter couldn't keep her students calm. They had begun leaping over the already piling bodies in the rear stairway. Weiler spent her last few minutes trying desperately to pull children free from the tangled pile and relieve the pressure as they tried to force their way toward the rear doors. At some point, she lost her footing and was trampled under the growing mass of children. Within minutes, hundreds of frantic parents and family members arrived at the school as word of the disaster spread throughout the city. Students got so wedged so tight that people who were from the community started running over and grabbing students by the hands from the outside of the building, trying to pull them free. They got some of them out. The custodian who was inside of the building started tossing some students out the window and started pushing some people out the doors, but eventually the wedge got so tight that students began to crush each other under their own weight. Parents grabbed their children's hands at the exit doors, started pulling at them, trying to get them loose from the crush of humanity, but were unsuccessful. Many parents watched their children die horrifically right in front of their eyes. Mothers driven mad by the sound of their children's screams fought their way to the door. One little girl named Jenny held her mother's hands and said, it's no use, Ma, I've got to die. As the fire crept up, her mother stroked her hair burning her own hand to the bone before being dragged away. At the front doors, most of the children were already dead. Wallace Upton had been helping the police and firefighters when he saw his 10-year-old daughter was caught near the bottom of the pile. Whew. She was badly burned and had been trampled, but was still alive. He tried with all his strength 
to tear her from the pressing weight as the flames moved ever closer, but he was unable to free her. He continued until he was severely burned himself and most of his clothes were reduced to ashes. Fritz Herder was still in the building. Gosh. All right, get a hold of yourself, man. There is a story of the, the local police chief. When he arrived on scene, he immediately started coordinating the efforts of rescue and trying to get the fire put out before the fire department arrived. His son, who was junior high or high school age, was leading a group of kindergartners out of the building. He got them down to the second floor and looked down and realized that he could not get them out the doors on either end of the building because of the mass of humanity at the doors. So he led the kindergartners to the fire escape. So he's on the outside fire escape with kindergartners. Well, the fire escape did not go all the way down to the ground outside. There was a little bit of a leap that needed to happen. Some of the kindergartners actually made the jump to safety, but several were too scared to make the leap and actually went back into a window inside the raging inferno. The police chief's son went in after them. He didn't make it either. There are stories after stories of that heroism that happened at this location. Fritz Herder was still in the building. He was able to save several children by tossing them through windows as he made his way out, attempting to pull them away from the doorway. Though his face and hands were scorched black, he continued pulling children from the pile until he could no longer save any more. He fled the building at the last second as more children were shoved onto the pile that was now over six feet high. The Collinwood Fire Department was a fire pumper drawn by horses. These horses were a mile away from the fire station. They were actually grading a road in the area. The fire chief was out of town. Their water pump was too weak to put water above the second floor. Their ladders were too short, and they had no axes at all. Axes that would have been handy to remove partitions at the exits and widen the escape route. The Collinwood Telegraph operator sent an urgent message to the Cleveland Fire Department four miles away. Engine 30 responded with a 1904 steam pumper and a ladder wagon. They pushed their horses as fast as they would go. For the last mile, they would have seen the pillar of smoke ahead to guide them. A shout of joy went up as the firefighters were sighted with ladders that would reach those on the upper floors. The driver was on his feet, lashing his horses into a mad gallop. Frantic men and women rushed forward to meet it, not waiting for the horses to stop. The ladders were dragged off and eager hands carried them forward, but the fire would have its final victims. The many precious lives that might have been saved were in the upper floor windows with outstretched arms. But the whole stairway made of Georgia pine disintegrated, sending the kids tumbling three floors into the coal room. In a little more than 20 minutes, all that stood of the smoldering school were the brick outer walls and smokestack. Rescue turned to recovery. 172 children lost their lives, as well as two teachers, Miss Fisk and Miss Weiler. A rescuer was also lost. John Kranyak, who was last seen running into the building as an attempt to rescue children, his body was recovered from the debris. Miss Weiler was never recovered. Removal of the bodies was done by the firefighters and railroad workers 
It was a gruesome task as they pulled blackened torsos and bits of human remains from the site. The nearby railroad shop was used as a makeshift morgue. The bodies were laid out in rows of 10. There were 16 rows. Many of the little bodies had fallen to pieces as they were removed from the debris, making identification even harder. In the end, each of the missing was found and identified except for 19 children and Miss Weiler. Some of them were thought to have burned to ashes, ashes that would remain in the ruins of the school. Around 8 p.m., the identified bodies were being carried by ambulance to their homes. The houses where a child lay were marked with a white ribbon on the door. Some houses had one white ribbon, some had two. Fritz Herder's door had three. And Arcade Street was adorned with 18. It was decided that the unclaimed children and 30 others, including the teacher, Grace Fisk, would be buried together in a common grave at Lakeview Cemetery. On March 6, the people of Collinwood began to bury their dead. An average of four funerals, some for multiple family members, were held every hour from sunrise to sunset and continued for three days. There were not enough funeral carriages available, so many had to use wagons and even streetcars to transport the small coffins to various cemeteries and churchyards. According to Cleveland's local newspaper, the village seemed to be one of vast processions of hearses and carriages. Scarcely did one funeral carriage pass before another came into sight, winding its way with its sorrowful burden to the burying grounds. Those who had no dead to mourn stood on the streets watching the grim procession as they passed. There was scarcely a dry eye in Collinwood. The following Monday, memorial and funeral services were held at Lakeview Cemetery for all the victims of the Collinwood School fire. Lakeview elementary children that survived served as pallbearers and other Cleveland school children made memorials in the shape of flowers. So a large funeral procession went to Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland. And that is where the memorial for the unknown who perished is located. There were so many unidentifiable bodies that they had to bury them in a mass grave site at that location at Lakeview. This happened on Ash Wednesday, which is sickeningly appropriate, if you ask me. Um, I just, I can't imagine what the parents were going through on that day. Blame for the fire was first laid at the doorstep of Fritz Herder. A crowd of nearly 500 people gathered outside his home and a contingent of police were called to protect him and his family. By the second day, however, when the Herder family emerged from their house, along with three small coffins bearing the remains of his own children, the crowd dispersed without incident. The bodies of Walter, Helena, and Ida Herder were found huddled together on the second floor. The fire marshal speculated the fire was caused by a poorly insulated steam pipe passing too close to a wooden joist under the front stairs. The report further concluded that the failure of the children to complete their exit in good order caused them to become jammed and congested in the exits and thus unable to escape the building. The report also claimed that the rear doors of the school opened inward and the children were jammed against the doors by other panic-stricken children pushing from behind. But the coroner's inquest included reports from the architects who designed the building, proving that the outer doors did indeed open outward in accordance with the law at the time. There was no one person to blame for what happened here in 1908. But a lot of things happened because of this fire. A lot of changes to building codes for schools happened. Making sure that exits were wider than needed to be. Making sure that all school doors opened out. Making sure that heating 
systems were properly insulated so that they couldn't transfer their heat to wooden structures. A lot of buildings started being built out of brick instead of wood. New fire safety measures like ladders that would reach the ground floor from fire escapes outside. And they were adopted all over the country because of what happened here. It's sad to think that 175 people had to die for that. To memorialize the tragic loss of life, a public garden was built on the side of the fire. Around the sides of the memorial are 175 tiles, each inscribed with the name of someone who died in the fire. Less than a year later, Memorial Elementary School was built adjacent to where Lakeview once stood. And on March 9, 1909, the State General Assembly declared the property a memorial park in memory of those who perished. Fritz Herger was cleared of any responsibility for the fire and continued working as a janitor for the local schools until he retired at the age of 70. He lived until he was 95, but seldom spoke about that fateful and tragic day. Fritz was eventually cleared of any responsibility for the tragedy. Despite the conclusion of the investigation, Herger still carried the emotional burden of the event for the rest of his life. It was certain that he had been traumatized by the event, just like everyone else who was affected by it. The tragic nature of the fire and its aftermath was etched into the memories of those who lived through it, and it continued to be a part of the local lore for decades to come. The building behind me was the former site of the Collinwood Memorial School. That was built, obviously, as a memorial to, to the school that stood in this location. Originally, the, uh, originally the, the state and the school board wanted to rebuild on this site that we're on now, but the parents just weren't having it. There is no way they were going to let another be, building be built on this site. They needed this site to be a memorial for their lost loved ones love that church music that's awesome so they built memorial school which lasted until i believe the 1970s and then fell into disrepair um, that school became that's that building started being used for other purposes and then was abandoned completely it is said that there are some nights when you can see lights going on inside that abandoned building and maybe even faces of children peering out the window. In the aftermath of the devastating fire, the families of the lost children were left to grapple with their grief and the overwhelming loss of their loved ones. They began to share stories with each other about strange occurrences happening in their homes. Some claim to have seen brief glimpses of their children who had perished in the fire, while others heard their voices calling out from another room, only to find no one there when they went to investigate. These experiences left the families feeling both comforted and unsettled. On one hand, they held the possibility that their lost children had returned to them to say goodbye or offer some solace in their time of grief. On the other hand, the eerie nature of these encounters left them feeling a sense of unease. Over time, the frequency of these visits from beyond the grave began to diminish. But for those families who experienced them, the memories would stay with them forever. A bittersweet reminder of the loved ones that they had lost, and the possibility that they still might be watching over them. The Collinwood Memorial School stood abandoned for decades after its closure in 1970s. Over time, it gained a reputation as a haunted place, with eerie tales circulating about strange occurrences inside its walls. As the building remained empty for so many years, few people dared to venture inside to investigate its haunted reputation. However, those brave enough to explore the abandoned school spoke of experiencing sudden chills and cold spots throughout the building. They also reported hearing the faint sounds of screaming children echoing through the empty halls. 
visitors to the Memorial Garden, situated on the site of the tragic fire that claimed so many young lives, have also reported eerie experiences. Many claim to smell the strong scent of smoke in the area, a haunting reminder of the terrible tragedy that occurred there so many years ago. On occasion, the smoky odor would become a sickening stench, forcing visitors to flee the garden in distress. Despite the school's closure and the passage of time, the memory of the Collinwood School fire and its aftermath continued to haunt the surrounding community, leaving a lasting impression on all those who dared to explore its haunted legacy. Thank you for watching, folks. We'll see you next time as we explore more curious history. Take care. Thank you.